Welcome everyone. So in this video, I'm going to do a walkthrough of the first exam in intermediate micro. And I'm going to go over the solutions trying to both, you know, explain each of them in great enough detail to be able to answer the questions that I can anticipate, but then also try to get through it relatively quickly so you don't have a long video to sit through. The other thing is this first question, this is question one for the multiple choice section. The questions came from like everybody answered the same questions, but potentially in a different order. So your number one probably wasn't this one. And each of the questions that you'll see me doing in turn, you've answered, but probably not in this order. Anyway, so that's that'll just sort of explain why my number one and number two doesn't match up with your number one and number two. All right. So. Uh, first, the multiple choice, then I'll go through portion two and portion three of the long form questions. All right, so where X is bandanas and Y is sweatshirts, if Kevin's utility function were utility coming from the minimum of 6X and then 3X plus 9Y. If the price of bandanas were $20 and the price of sweatshirts were $40, Kevin would demand oh, three times as many bandanas as sweatshirts. Okay, so then the question is, well, how do we get there? So what we want to do is we want to think about the form of our utility function. Well, this is kind of like perfect complements, although it's got this substitutes portion with this 3x plus 9y. So we want to think carefully about how to deal with that. And basically what's going to happen is we're going to have a one portion that's going to be a constant. We've got to decide is this going to be vertical or is this going to be horizontal? And we've got another portion that's going to have some slope to it. All right, so as we're thinking about this, the starting point can just be, let's replace this comma with an equal sign. Let's find the line that goes through the kinks because we know that we're gonna have that at least as a starting point. So I replace this comma with an equals, 6x equals 3x plus 9y, I've done, I've done that here. And then just solving algebraically, subtract 3x from this 6x gives me 3x. And then this 9y is right here. I can divide through by nine, that gives me one third x equals y. And I want it in that form so that I can write, you know, y in the vertical, x on the horizontal. And I get my line through the origin that's also gonna collect the kinks of this, these indifference curves. All right, so the next thing we wanna do is we wanna think about what's gonna happen to the slope above and beyond, and above and below that line. So what I always like to do is try some test points. So I've done that here. I'm gonna try two points. I'm gonna test the point three zero and the point zero three, and I'm gonna see which portion of my, in, of my utility function is governing the utility at that point, right? So I'm gonna evaluate my utility function at the point three zero, x is three, y is zero. So six times three is 18, and then three times three is nine, plus zero is nine. Oh, the smaller of those two is nine. And so when I'm at the point three zero, that's along the horizontal axis, but right on the horizontal axis, my utility is being governed by this portion, by the second portion, the sort of substitutes portion. All right, what if I have only Y? All right, so I'm gonna evaluate my utility at the point zero three. Okay, so, uh, well, if X is zero, six times zero is, zero, and then three times zero, oh, zero, and then just my y was three, or nine y, okay, so I, okay, so this should be 27, this should be nine times three, okay, fine, whatever. The smaller of these two is gonna be zero, that's why I didn't catch that, and so, okay, if we have no, none of the x good, only the y good, our utility is being governed by this first portion, the six x portion. All right, so that tells me that the weird portion, the kind of constant portion has to be above the line, the, the line y equals one third x. How else can we see that we can plot that point, right? Plot the point zero three that's here, well, here, plot the point three zero, and then you, you see where we are relative to this line, and then what the MRS, well, you can't quite get that, but what it would be at those two points. Okay, so, the last thing we have to do is decide how are we going to treat this 6x? Is this going to be a horizontal, are these going to be horizontal lines or are this going to be vertical lines? And what we want to think about here is think about what's happening with complements preferences. Well, you have to kind of, if standard perfect complements preferences, like, um, so suppose it's just the minimum of x and y, to get onto a higher indifference curve, you have to get more of both. Well, here that's not happening. That's only happening with one good, the x good. And if I want to get into a higher indifference curve, what has to happen is I've got to get, well, more, more x and then also more y. But what's happening is as I increase my x, I'm going to be jumping to the next indifference curve. And so that's why I've drawn this with, with vertical lines, right? So as I increase my x, as I get more x, I'm potentially moving to a higher indifference curve. I mean, it kind of depends where, we, where exactly we are. If we had horizontal lines here, then I could be 
increasing my X sort of, you know, unboundedly without increase it, without um, increasing my potential utility level. So just one way that you kind of think about this is since this has both X and Y, suppose we got like a whole bunch of Y for free. Like I just gave you like a million units of Y. All right. And so whatever is going to be my limiting factor is is the other one, the X. And so if I have like a million Y, so now I've got like 9 million here, then however much X I have is going to be my utility level. So if I have one X, even though I've got like 9 million coming through Y, my X is just going to be six. All right. Well, how do I get to a higher indifference curve that I need more X? And so what has to happen is I got to be moving, like jumping over to a higher indifference curve. Right. So that's what's anyway, that's what's going on there. Okay, so now we want to go ahead and solve this thing. So the solution is at the kink. So that's going to be at the point where, or well, that's going to be where x is equal to 3y or you know, y is equal to one third x. And so just interpreting this, well, okay, so we don't have, you know, we've got prices. Um, sorry, I, I went a little bit too fast through the conclusion the solutions at the kink. Let me come back to that. We have prices, we don't have income. So we can't quite make the budget constraint, but we can make like candidate budget constraints. So I've done that here. Here is one budget constraint with a price ratio of minus one half, right? So bandanas are on the horizontal, that was our X. And then uh, sweatshirts are on the vertical, that was our Y. Okay, so good. Uh, then I'm gonna think of a whole cluster of these potential budget constraints corresponding to however much income the consumer has, right? The endpoints are just M divided by the price, M divided by the price, right? So this is like this endpoint is M over PY, this, this is M over PX, right? So as we get higher levels of incomes or lower level of incomes, we're shifting our budget constraint. So I've got a whole bunch of budget constraints and I'm thinking about where is this thing going to cross? Well, this thing's vertical here. This thing's got a slope of minus one third, right? That was coming from, uh, 3x plus 9y, the MRS over here is 3 divided by 9 is 1 third. Okay, good. The budget constraint is going to be a little bit steeper than this portion, though not as steep as that portion. So where the, where the optimal is going to be is indeed at the kink. Now that that's established, we can just look at this, uh, look at this proportion and see in our optimal, x is going to equal 3y. So if our bandanas are, 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 uh, X and then our sweatshirts are our Y, we are going to have three times as many bandanas as sweatshirts. And as you're looking at this rate, sometimes the proportions are difficult to kind of follow through. Let's just imagine, suppose I have nine bandanas, right? So nine bandanas, if that, for this to equal the amount of, for nine to equal three Y, then Y is equal to three, all right? So that I'd have, if I have nine bandanas and three sweatshirts, I'd have three times as many bandanas as sweatshirts because nine bandanas is three times three sweatshirts. And that's what's reflected here. Okay, so uh, question two, suppose your utility function for food and for clothing is UFC equals F plus four C. If you reduce your clothing consumption by two units, how much do you have to increase your food consumption in order to maintain the same utility level? So here what we wanna do is we wanna think of what happened, these are perfect substitutes preferences, but we don't have a budget constraints. We can't say anything about like where we, cur where we currently are. All we can really do is just think about like what's the penalty of losing clothing relative to our overall utility? Okay, so here we have clothing is entering into our utility at a rate of marginal utility of clothing is four. So if C falls by two, the penalty is going to be a loss of eight, right? So if we're going to stay at the same utility level, we've got to compensate by increasing food by eight. So that's why it's eight. All right. If prices and income in a two good society double, what happens to the budget line? Oh, so I remember I explained the endpoints of our budget constraint was just income divided by price. So if we double both, the two cancels, nothing happens to our intercepts, right? So there'd be no effect on the budget line if our prices and income all double. To understand consumer behavior and how consumer decisions are made, it's necessary and or sufficient to work with ordinal utility functions. Utility is an ordinal concept. Um, so ordinal means we're kind of focusing on the ordering, the rank order. The idea is the utility function is going to preserve the same ordering relationship of the underlying preferences. And as a matter of fact, there's a lot of different utility functions that can represent the same preference structure. The key is they're going to return, they're going to assign higher utility numbers to more preferred bundles. And cardinal, well, this is where like magnitude also matters. And so anyway, so we want ordinal utility functions. All right, so uh, 
Bob views apples and oranges as perfect substitutes in his consumption, and MRS equals 1 for all consumptions of the two goods in his indifference map. Suppose the price of apples is $2 per pound and the price of oranges is $3 per pound. Bob's budget is $3, $30 per week. What's Bob's utility maximizing choice between these goods? Okay, so Bob's got perfect subs. We've got the marginal rate of substitution. And what I always like doing is thinking about like what would be our bang for your buck principle. So take the ratio of the marginal utility versus the price. So I have marginal utility of apples divided by the price of apples, marginal utility of oranges divided by the price of oranges. And then we realize, wait a second, if MRS equals one, that tells us that MUA equals MUB because that's MUA divided by MUB. So if that equals one, they're the same. So I'm just gonna re replace marginal utility, like just kind of drop the, the subscript. So, mar so what I'm comparing is the marginal utility divided by the price of apples and then the marginal utility because it's shared with oranges by the price of oranges. All right, so what's the consumer going to try to do? They're going to tip their consumption in the direction of whichever one is going to be increasing wh wherever they're getting the most utility per the price. All right, so most <laughs> biggest marginal utility per the price. All right, so what this is telling us is, well, whatever number we have, we divide that by two is a bigger number than if we divide it by three. So this is telling us we want more apples, right? So MU2 is gonna be bigger than MU divided by three. So we want more apples. Well, we got perfect subs, so if we're getting more apples, we're just gonna exhaust our budget on apples. So that tells us we're gonna divide our income of 30 by the price of apples, which is two, and get 15 apples and no oranges, right? So this is our all apples solution. All right, so Sue views hot dogs and hot dog buns as complements in Sue's consumption, and the corners of Sue's indifference curves follow the 45 degree line. Suppose the price of hot dogs is $5 per package and the price of buns is $3 per package. Uh, Sue's budget is $48 per month. What's Sue's optimal choice under this scenario? The fact that there's eight hot dogs and eight hot dog buns is just important so that we know that we don't have any waste. Like you could buy one package and then you'll be able to use them all. Otherwise, we'd have to worry about like counting individual hot dogs and individual buns and that'd just be bad. Although in reality, right, hot dogs tend to be sold in packages of 10 and buns in packages of eight. And so you need to like if you if you're like me and you don't like you want to make sure that every hot dog has a hot dog bun then you find yourself like buying 40 hot dogs and enough for to make 40 complete hot dogs so anyway uh all right what we can do here is we can make out our perfect complements and difference map right we're told that we've got perfect complements we're told the indifference curves follow the 45 degree line what this is meant to do is like hopefully we remember okay perfect complements is going to be utility is going to be you have uh, U of X, Y is going to just be the smallest of X and Y. The other thing, like if we didn't kind of pick up on that, we have the corners of the indifference curves at the 45 degree line. So that's the line Y equals X. And then maybe you draw something kind of like this. This is what they look like, but maybe you draw something like this. And we're kind of thinking about what this is going to do. Okay. So at the optimal, like at the kink, we're going to have Y equals X, the same number of packages of hot dog buns and hot dogs. And then we want to think about what our budget constraint is doing. So Sue's budget constraint, let's see, the price is going to be five times the amount of hot dogs plus three times the amount of hot dog buns equals 48. So that's what this is. 5x plus 3y equals 48. Oh, but wait a second. At the optimum, at the kink, we're going to have the same amount of x and y. So I'm just going to replace y with x. So 5x plus 3x is 48 or x is equal to six. Just solving. If x is six, then y is six. And this is our, our answer, six packages of each. All right. So if PX equals PY, then when the consumer maximizes utility, what is true? Is it X must equal Y? Is it MUX must equal MUY? Is it MUX may equal MUY, but not necessarily so? Is it X and Y must be substitutes? Okay, so if I would have said that, and I had to revise this, if I would have said that, like originally I wanted to say, we have an interior solution, we have well-behaved preferences. If we had something like this, if we had this sort of nice Cobb Douglas utility function and we had a nice tangency point, then definitely if the price of the two goods are equal, then the price ratio is just one, which forces MUX to equal MUY. And then that would be the best answer. But if we are allowing ourselves to have perfect substitutes preferences, we could have other things happening. So for instance, here we've got our budget constraint. This has a slope of one, right? I, I mean for this to have a slope of one. And then the consumer could be optimizing, right? Could be maximizing utility on this highest indifference curve that crosses the budget constraint in our, al in our alley solution. Or here, 
crosses our budget constraint in our Alex solution, all Y versus all X. If the marginal rate of substitution is bigger than one, we could be optimizing here. If it's less than one, it could be optimizing here. And so this is basically this is basically Y. So marginal utility of X may equal marginal utility of Y, but not necessarily so. The, uh, like addendum is basically because perfect subs preferences exist. And if we had perfect subs preferences, then these would be off, these would be places where we're maximizing utility without marginal rate of substitute or without MUX equaling MUY. All right, so Courtney DeWalter, um, one of the top ultra runners in the world, uh, utility function is Cobb Douglas. If Courtney's, in, if Courtney's income were 40 and the price of gels were two and the price of Stroop waffles were three, how many gels would there be in the best bundle that Courtney could afford? All right, so there's a couple different ways to do this. Firstly, like you could write out your Lagrangian, but I meant for this to be a really cheap sort of low cost Cobb Douglas problem, right? So I said in lecture, we know our common Cobb Douglas demands and I want you to remember those. So I wanted to give you a place to use them. So here's a good place to use them. So if you set out the Lagrangian and took, found the marginal utility of X divided by the marginal utility of Y, or I guess like marginal utility of XA divided by the marginal utility of XB, you'll ultimately get the MRS, like our familiar Cobb Douglas MRS is gonna be XB over XA. Our price ratio is gonna be two thirds. And then we have our budget constraint. Now, then you could solve, right? You could you could uh, get what two XA equals three XB. You could kind of substitute and solve, and you could find our demands. The other thing you could do is you could remember our Cobb Douglas demands. So our demand for good A is going to be one over. Well, our Cobb Douglas demands for good X is going to be um, A over A plus B times. M over PX. And I don't know this, I use good notes and it always puts these weird things in here. So I don't want to click on that link because who it's like the wild west. I, who knows what that's going to be. So uh, anyway, and that's, <laughs> anyway, so um, we want to know how much uh, Courtney is going to be able to afford of gels, which we said was uh, good XA. Okay, good. So here's our demands. We're going to plug in Courtney's income of 40 divided by uh, two times the price of gels, which is two. So 40 divided by four is 10. Okay, so there's the solution. All right, so the fact that Courtney spends no money on travel, what does this mean? Implies Courtney does not derive any satisfaction from travel. Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, implies Courtney is not, or at a corner solution. Um, maybe. Implies <laughs> Courtney's MRS is not equal to price ratio. Maybe, actually any of these are possible. That's the best answer, right? It could be like you could spend no money on travel because you just don't like traveling or because there's a pandemic and you can't travel. Uh, it could, and all the races are canceled. It could be because Courtney's had, a, Courtney's had a corner solution. And that would be kind, it'd be a little bit kind of like the first one where just like spending all money on something else. Um, and then could be that the MRS does not equal the, implies that the MRS does not equal the price ratio. Yet yeah, that's kind of what happens at corner solutions. So any of those are possible. It's not, I said kind of what happens. <laughs> It's definitely what happens at corner solutions is the MRS doesn't equal the price ratio. All right, so Sean uses the entire budget to purchase Pepsi and hamburgers and currently produces no Pepsi and six hamburgers per week. Price of Pepsi is a dollar per can. Price of a hamburger is two. Sean's marginal utility from Pepsi is two. Marginal utility from hamburgers is six. Is Sean's current consumption design decision optimal? All right, so here what we wanna do is we wanna find the ratio of marginal utility of hamburgers to the price of hamburgers. So six over two is three and the ratio of the marginal utility of Pepsi to the price of Pepsi, so two over one is two. Oh, well, the marginal utility per price derived from hamburgers is more than it is from Pepsi, and so Sean ought to buy more hamburger. And so, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, the corner solution is best because their MRS is less than the price ratio. Uh, let's see, one example where you're buying more hamburger and no Pepsi, oh, that could be where you're, uh, let's see, we said, no Pepsi and six hamburgers per week. That is a corner solution. Yeah, their MRS could be less than their price ratio. It'd be like this picture right here where we have flatter indifference curves than the budget constraint. And this would be like our alley, our all Y solution. All right, with respect to consuming cookies and coffee, two consumers face the same prices and both claim to be in equilibrium. We know they have the both same, both have the same marginal utility for cookies. Uh, it's not, not necessarily. They both have the same marginal utility for coffee. Eh, not necessarily. So even if we had like a Cobb Douglas, you could have, so we, the requirement could be that, um, so it, it, the requirement could be that they've got, if they have the same prices, they have the same MRS. 
but we don't necessarily know. Like this is the one, um, this is, uh, we don't necessarily know that it could be like, it could be that they have the same marginal utility for cookies. It could be that they have the same marginal utility for coffee. It can't be all of these because we don't necessarily know. All we know is that they have the same marginal rate of substitution of, uh, of food for coffee as kind of our, as kind of our best answer. Uh, now, technically, yeah, again, we might have a situation where they actually have, they face the same prices. They are both in equilibrium. They're both optimizing and they have a different MRS because we could have one where one has very, one has more steep, their perfect substitutes preferences and one is more steep than the other. Even so, it, it can't be all of these because we can't claim even under, even under those circumstances or especially under those circumstances, we couldn't, cl we couldn't claim that they had the same marginal utility for cookies and same marginal utility for coffee, right? So it can't be all of these. The best answer is they had the most, they have the best, or they have the same MRS of food for coffee. All right, so Ben derives utility from consuming iced tea and lemonade. For the bundle, Ben is currently consuming. The marginal utility Ben receives from iced tea is 16 utils, and the marginal utility Ben receives from lemonade is eight utils. So instead of consuming this bundle, what should Ben do? Um, all right, so we have the marginal utility from iced tea. We have the marginal utility from lemonade. We know it's bigger for iced tea, but we don't know anything about the prices. And therefore, it's really difficult to give any type of advice. We can't say buy more of one or, or less of the other or whatever. So none of the above is necessarily correct. It could be, depending on the price. If the prices were the same, if we gave that piece of information, then we'd be able to make a definitive answer. But none of these is necessarily correct. All right, Jack has the utility function. U of xy equals uh, minimum of 2x plus plus y and then 3y where x is measured on the horizontal axis and y is on the vertical axis. Jack's indifference curve consists of, oh, this is a lot like the first one with Kevin, right? Where, but where we had like 6x and that gave us like vertical above the kink. This is going to give us 3y. This is going to give us horizontal like below the kink, right? And so the horizontal line segment and a negatively sloped line segment that meet in a kink along the line x equals y. So to verify that we have to just replace this comma with an equal sign. 2x plus y is equal to 3y, 2x equals 2y, x equals y. That allows us to discount this one and this this one immediately and this one. And then we're just focusing on, is it this one or this one? So we can have a positively sloped line segment and a negatively line segment, or we're gonna have a horizontal line segment and a negatively sloped line segment. No, it's gonna be horizontal. And we're gonna have to get increasing amounts of y to be able to get to higher utility functions. Sorry, higher indifference curves. All right, so a Lodi has preferences represented by uh, 4x, well, four times the square root of x1 plus x2. If a Lodi were initially consuming 49 units of pretzels, good one, and 12 units of cheese, good two, what's the largest amount of cheese that a Lodi would be willing to give up in return for an additional 32 units of pretzels? So there's this, probably the simplest way to do this is let's just find a Lodi's current utility. So just like evaluate at this bundle. So 49 and 12, again, there's this weird link to click. I hope I don't click on it. Who knows? It's from good notes. Not, I don't know. So whatever. Um, all right. So the square root of 49, seven times four is 28 plus 12 is 40. Good. So that's our starting point. And then let's see, we want to think about what's going to happen if we get 32 units of pretzels. Oh, wait. Well, so, you know, 49 plus 32, that's 81. And then recognize that we could take the square root of that. And that's a nice integer. And so let's just evaluate four times nine. Okay. 36 plus C has to get us back to 40, right? Four, where's this 40 coming from? This is our utility level here. We want to be at the same utility level because we want to think about how much they're willing to give up to get back to where they were. Uh, okay, so we have to get up back up to 40. 36 plus 4, right, gets us to 40. And so if we have 4 units of cheese, oh, that's a decrease from where we were. We initially had 12, lose 8 to get down to 4. All right, so Max's preferences are represented by Cobb Douglas preferences, A times B. Well, these are the numbers of apples and bananas that Max is consuming. If Max is consuming 40 apples and 160 bananas, we put apples on the horizontal axis, bananas on the vertical axis. The slope of Max's indifference curve at the current consumption is. All right, so basically we just have like our standard Cobb Douglas indifference curves. Just draw nice, well-behaved indifference curves and then draw something that's higher than... <laughs> further uh, further up than it is to the right, right? So here's the A axis, here's the B axis, here's zero. 
and we're just going to draw this point. It's at 160 and then 40. So this is in the steep portion of the of our Cobb Douglas uh, indifference curve. So we know that we're kind of in this area. We're going to look for some number that's bigger than one, right? So immediately we're going to forget about minus one fourth and minus one eighth. It turns out like you could hopefully you remember, but we could set up the Lagrangian. You could find the you could find the tangency condition well we've got now we don't have prices so you'd have to do this with a generic budget constraint which you could do but by the time you got there you'd have this margin rate of substitution of for Cobb Douglas preferences which is b over a and then just evaluating at the present bundle well b is 160 a is 40 right and so we have 160 divided by 40 is minus four. Oh, that's the right answer okay so then we have owen with preferences represented by utility over a good one and good two is going to be the minimum of x1 plus 2x2 and then 2x1 plus x2. Owen's got $42 or 40, $40 to spend on chips and then on fish. If the price of chips is $4 and the price of chip, uh, fish is $2, Owen will. All right, so we've got fish is our good two. We've got chips is our good one. I drew my line through the origin, a 45 degree line that's collecting my kinks as x2 is equal to x1. How do I know to do that? Well, remember we can replace the comma with an equal sign and then solving, we'll get, move this uh, x1 to that side, x2 to this side, we'll get x2 is equal to x1. Okay, so that's the line that goes through the kinks through the origin. And then I need the budget constraint. Budget constraint is gonna have the, the price ratio is going to have a is going to have a slope of minus two because the price of chips is four price of fish is two so that's going to have a slope of two and then i need the slopes of the indifference curves above and below the 45 degree line right so uh, the mrs on this portion is minus one half the mrs on this portion is two right because margin utility of x is one margin utility of y is two so mrs is one half margin utility of x is two margin utility of y is one so mrs is two now we've got to decide it's going to be steeper or flatter above or below this line all right so let's just take a test point let's take the point zero two so uh, zero plus two times two is four two times zero is zero plus two is two. Oh, so the point zero two is going to generate a utility of well four comma two or just two the smaller of the two is going to be over here which tells us at the point zero two the utility is going to be governed by this wing of the utility function and so that's going to tell us the mrs is going to be minus two above the line y equals or x2 equals x1 because the point zero two is going to be above the line y equals x or x2 equals x1 in other words, what you can do is you can take a test point, you can take a bundle that you know is either somewhere up here or somewhere down here, and then see what the MRS has to be by virtue of determining which side, which of these two is going to generate the utility based on whichever is smallest. So I did that in the lecture notes as well, but you know, it's just kind of a recap. All right, so basically what then happens is the price ratio is minus two, the slope of the indifference curve up here is minus two, so we're gonna have at the optimum a continuum of solutions because the budget constraint is gonna be coincident with one of our indifference curves, at least at the portion above the line x2 equals x1. This is gonna give us the answer, consume at least as many fish as chips, but might consume both. They could consume the, the same amount, they could consume both. Uh, we could actually be at the kink right here because that's gonna be consistent with these two coincident lines having let's see at least as many fish as chips allows us to be at least as many fish as chips allows us to have more fish than chips right and so that's why it's at least as many uh, fish as chips but not uh, at least as many chips as fish because at least as many chips as fish would require would allow that we have possibly more chips than fish so we want to what's well, got to be this one because we want to have possibly more fish than chips Right? The amount of fish is the vertical, the amount of chips is the horizontal. All right, Cali is trying to decide which courses to take next semester. Cali has narrowed down the choice of two courses, Econ 490 and Econ 485. Now Cali is having trouble and cannot decide which two courses to take. It's not the case that Cali is indifferent between the two courses. Cali just can't decide. An economist would say this is an example of preferences that are incomplete. Right, preferences that are complete preferences mean that you can you can take any two bundles and say which one you like better. 
So those would be incomplete preferences. Kelly consumed 100 units of X, 50 units of Y when the price of X was $2 and the price of Y was $4. If the price of X rose to $6 and the price of Y rose to, rose to $6, how much would Kelly's income have to rise so Kelly could still afford their original bundle? All right, so the original bundle costs 400, right? Two times 100 is 200. Four times 50 is 200, so that's 400. And then the new bundle cost, six times 100 is 600, plus six times 50 is 300 or 900, which means Kelly's gonna need 500 more dollars, right? Okay, so 500. If in the time it takes to read 40 pages of philosophy and 30 pages of history, Lindsay could read 20 pages of philosophy, 90 pages of history, then which of these equations de de describes combinations of pages of philosophy and history that Lindsay could read in the time it takes to read 40 pages of philosophy and 30 pages of history? All right, so here's our budget constraint, 40p plus 30h equals m, and then also 20p plus 90h equals m. And uh, let's see, so so what I wanted to do then is I said, all right, let's just kind of, let's just, um, let's solve the system of equations and try to get a relationship between p and h, all right? So what I did is I subtracted one from the other, so I've got 20p minus 60, right? So 40 minus 20p is 20p. 30h minus 90h is 60h. m minus m is zero. And then we find the proportion of philosophy to history as p is equal to 3h. Okay. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, let's plug this into our budget constraint and let's, let's, um, and let's, uh, find our, let's find our proportion of let, let's get our let's let's get our time cost in terms of the income. All right, so 40 times 3h plus 30h equals m. So 120h plus 30h equals m, or 150h equals m. And then solving for h, now we've got like our amount of history read in terms of like income. So m over 150. Okay, so if our expenditure on history is going to be m over 150, then our expenditure on philosophy is going to be three, you know, three times. So um, three times m over 150, and then uh, canceling, we have m over 50. Okay, so my expenditure on history is m over 150. My expenditure on philosophy is m over 50, if I'm Lindsay. And then we'll plug this back into our budget constraint. So here I'm going to have... Um, I'm going to have my expenditure times the amount of history plus my expenditure on philosophy times the amount of philosophy uh, is income, right? So I have then just, uh, uh, let's see. So then I divided through by M. And so I have H over 150 plus P over 50 is equal to one. And then multiplying through by 150, I have H plus three P is 150. Gets me a budget constraint that's got only H's, P's, and then uh, the amount of, um, the amount of time available. So that's 3p plus h is 150. So Max insists on consuming two units of waffles per unit of croissant. If the price of croissants is $4 and the price of waffles is $4 and Max's income is M, Max's demand for croissants will be... All right, so uh, let's see. So if Max is going to consume two units of waffles per unit of croissant, these are perfect complements preferences. And so this is going to be the minimum of W times 2C. Right. So, all right. So suppose I have one croissant, then I'm going to have, um, then I'm going to have two waffles. So one bundle that I would like would be two waffles and one croissant, right? Two waffles if I'm max. So one, so two waffles and one croissant. So if this is two, then, and this is one, whichever is a smaller of two and then two times one is two, right? So this utility function works. The other like candidate utility function you might've thought of would be like, uh, minimum of 2w and c but then try like a bundle that we know max is going to like so two waffles and one croissant and you'll see that th that would be wasteful if you if you'll have not the same number on both sides here right okay so that's the first thing now i'm going to replace this comma with an equal sign and find the line through the origin that goes through my kinks that'll be the line c is equal to w over 2 i guess i didn't bother to draw my indifference curves all right fine uh and then I go to my budget constraint, 4w plus 4c is equal to m, right? Price was 4, price was 4, and then my income was 4. And I know the relationship between croissants and waffles is c is equal to w over 2. So 4w plus 4 times w over 2 is equal to m. 2's cancel, so 4 plus uh, 2w, 4w plus 2w is m, or 
uh, 6w is equal to m or w is equal to m over 6. So if waffles is m over 6 then and croissants is waffles over 2, then my demand for croissants is going to be m over 12. Sure enough. Right. All right. With respect to consuming cookies and coffee, two consumers choose the same bundles and both claim to be in equilibrium. We therefore know same MRS of food for coffee. Now, maybe, like if we required an interior solution, then that would work. Both fa face the same prices. Um, if we had a little bit more information, like if we had an interior solution and the same MRS, uh, if they both face the same budget lines, no, it, like even under the best of circumstances, that's not a requirement. What's really matter, what's really gonna matter is the, uh, is the price ratio. Um, so the best answer here is none of these. The one that we might really think about though would be like they both have the same MRS of food for coffee, but no, because you could have a corner solution, right? Because I didn't require, I, wouldn't, I didn't require that we have an interior solution. So we could have a steeper, um, we could have a, one person has a much steeper indifference curve than the other and they're both optimizing with the same bundle of like all x okay now for the longer form questions so consider a utility maximizing consumer with preferences represented by these cobb douglas preferences with this constant a so x to the one fourth y to the three fourth uh, write down our Lagrangian and find the consumer's Marshallian demands for good X and good Y. And then true or false, if the price of good X is at least twice the price of good Y, the consumer spends at least half their income on good X. Explain or show. Actually, you can answer part B like immediately because you can think about what our Cobb-Douglas demands are for good X and then what our expenditure on good X has to be. And then you know this has to be false. I'll show you that in a second though. All right, so the Lagrangian we'll write out is right here. Here's our part A. Whoops. Here's our part A. So um, here's our Lagrangian. Take the partial with respect to x, that's this. Take the partial with respect to y. Divide this by this and this by this. And that gives us our tangency condition. y over 3x is equal to px over py. And then we get something that we can substitute into our budget constraint and then solving, right? So we get like a 3x px equals uh, y py. And then replacing y py with a 3x px gives us this, okay? And then uh, plus px, this gives us what? 4px, and then dividing through gives us x is equal to m over 4px. All right, so uh, those are, our, what was I asking for? Our, yeah, there's our Marshallian demands. So those are going to be m over 4px. And then if you find the one for y, it'll be 3 fourths m over py. It's just the opposite substitution. And then let's see. So if the price of X is at least twice the price of good Y, the consumer spends at least half their income on good X, explain or show. Well, look, here we can take our demand for good X. Let's multiply Let's multiply through by PX, so I get PXX, right? That's this right here. This is nothing other than our expenditure on good X. It's gonna be a quarter of my income, right? With Cobb-Douglas preferences, the consumer spends a constant share of their income on each good. For this consumer, it's gonna be a quarter. This consumer is gonna spend a quarter of their income always on good X. And so it's not gonna matter what the prices are, right? What the relationship of the prices are, okay. The relative prices are. <laughs> All right, so consumer with preferences represented by the standard sort of Cobb-Douglas preferences where the uh, exponent is one half square root, uh, which is to attain utility level of U at the lowest possible expenditure. So we want our consumer's expenditure minimization problem. Write down the Lagrangian and find the consumer's Hicksian demands for good one and good two. All right, so I, I'm gonna draw this down here and then question three I'm gonna do on the next page. All right, so get our familiar tangency condition. How do we do this? Well, right, so we have to write our Lagrangian, that's this right here, right? The Lagrangian for our consumer's expenditure minimization problem is going to be the expenditure minus the constraint, right? So PX1, um, P1X1 plus P2X2 minus, and then this is the constraint. Remember, how's this different from the utility max? Well, with the utility max, it's going to be the utility function. The, where the utility function appears is in our objective function, and where the budget constraint appears is in our constraint. Now what's happening with our expenditure minimization problem is the expenditure is our objective function. That's what we're acting on. We're trying to minimize here. And our constraint is actually our utility. It's that we are trying to reach with this utility function, U bar as our level of utility. 
All right, so then we can take our partial derivatives. So the partials are going to be, uh, let's see, um, p1 uh, minus, this is p1 equals, so, but p1 minus, this, uh, this stuff equals zero. And then over here, this is the, I guess I, this should have like a p1 or p2. I was not super careful here, but it boils down to our familiar tangency condition. Basically what happens is we're going to divide the price portion the P1 divided by P2, and that's going to give us our price ratio. Maybe I even should have written this on the left side, but there's this nice relationship between uh, between the two utility functions. But anyway, so, uh, and then this portion, we're going to divide uh, the, the marginal utility of X right here by the marginal utility of Y or X1 by X2. We're going to get a bunch of things that cancel. We're going to get our X2 over X1. Then we substitute, like the really interesting thing, like this is all in, in the notes, but the part that we're kind of reminding of where people might kind of had, have had trouble on the exam is once you have the tangency condition, you got to substitute this back into the constraint. And what you might be tempted to do is try to plug this into something that looks like a budget constraint. Nope, the constraint in this function is the utility portion. It's a U bar minus the utility function. And so we're going to, the constraint is U equals X1 or square root of X1 times the square root of X2. And so if we do that, then, uh, and we have to substitute. So the substitution I'm going to make is X, what did I do? I did, sub, I substituted for X2. So I did X2 is equal to P1 over P2 times X1, right? So P1 over P2 times X1, I substituted for X2 in my constraint, right? The utility function was X1 to the half, X2 to the half. I replaced X2 with X2 equals P1 over P2 times X1. That's this right here or that's this down here. And then just cleaning this up, let's see, we have, we'll have an x1 to the 1 half, x1 to the 1 half, that's just gonna be an x1, right? Because same base, add the powers, x1. And then this is gonna be a p1 over p2, oh, square root of that. Okay, good, and then what we want is to get this in terms of x, so I'm gonna divide through, and I'm gonna get x star is equal to p2 over p1, square root, times u bar. And then for x2, it's going to be the reverse. So maybe we remember this. It's just going to be flipped. p1 over p2, square root of that, uh, times uh, u bar. So these are our Hicksian demands for good one and good two. And to get our expenditure function, we just got to plug these back into the objective function. This is now an x star, x1 star. This is x2 star times p2 and p1. Okay, good. So that's what this is doing. So my expenditure function is going to be my p1 times my x1 star plus my p2 times my x2 star. So just making the substitution from right here. And I'm going to have a P1 times a P2 to the square root of P2 times or divided by a square root of P1. That's going to cancel and give me a P1 half, okay, times P2 1 half. Okay, so that's what this is doing here. And then this U bar, that didn't have a power on it. Same thing over here. I'm going to get a P2 1 half times a P1 1 half times just a regular U bar. And then adding up, I'm going to get two of these, right? This is multiplication is commutative and so this is like two of those so i'm gonna have two times u bar p1 p2 a square root of that stuff or half power as i've written it is going to give us our expenditure okay cool so question three is our quasi-linear question so i like this one uh what did i okay so here's the solution up here and then i put the I restated the question down here so the utility function is x plus natural log of y faces prices of uh two and then one with income of 16, find the consumer's optimal bundle of X and Y. If the consumer receives two, bundle, two units of X for free and exhausts the budget, what's the consumer's optimal bundle? If the consumer receives two units of Y for free and exhausts its budget, what's the consumer's optimal bundle? Okay, so the first thing we want to do is find the marginal, the marginal rate of substitution. So marginal utility of X is 1, right? Take the partial with respect to X, that's just 1. Uh, take the partial with respect to y. The derivative of the natural log of y is with respect to y is just 1 over y. 1 divided by 1 over y is y. So MRS equals y equals my price ratio, which is 2 over 1, which is equal to 2. And immediately, we see that the demand for y is just going to be 2. Well, if that's true, we just go to our budget constraint and find our demand for x, right? So plugging into our budget constraint, right? 2x plus, um, 2x plus 2 is equal to 16. Uh, okay, so that's 2x plus y is equal to 16, 2x plus 2 is 16, so 2x equals 14, or x equals 7. That's where that came from. All right, so now we are given x2, uh, two units of x, and we've got to find how much 
of why we want. All right, so uh, let's see. What the consumer really wants, though, is demand for Y is two. So it's going to get those two units of Y and then exhaust the budget on X. Like that's how quasi linear utility works. And so, and the other thing we could do is we could look at our, compare our marginal utility or marginal rate of substitution to the price ratio at that starting point. So if I have two units of X and no Y, then my price ratio is two, but my amount of Y is zero. Oh, but wait a second. My amount of Y is also my MRS. So if my MRS is zero and the price ratio is two, this tells us, oh, we should actually increase the amount of Y that we have. We want to get more Y. This is like, the, if the MRS is less than the price ratio, this is like our all Y solution. Think of like borrow the intuition from perfect substitutes. This is where we have flatter indifference curves than the budget constraint. That tells us we want more of good Y. Okay, so how much of good Y do we want? Exactly two units. Once we've got those two, then we'll exhaust the budget on good X. And that allows us to buy the seven units we had from before, right? So our, our bundle basically becomes uh, the seven, the uh, seven two plus the two is nine two. Okay. Now suppose we get two units of Y for free and we want to exhaust our budget. What's the consumer's optimal bundle? Oh, we've got our Y for free. That was the two units of Y that we wanted. Now we're just going to spend everything on X, right? And looking at our comparing the margin rate of substitution of two to the price ratio of two tells us we're fine in terms of Y, but we do need to exhaust our budget. So just spending our budget on X, 16 divided by two is eight. So we get eight units of X, uh, two units of Y. Okay, and okay, so now here's our study puppy, or study, study puppy break. Here's our puppy study break. All right, so here's puppy. This puppy shows up in the earlier videos and now here's puppy kind of grown up. So puppy found a, puppy found a hole. All right, um, so for the first one here, um, oh, I've got I've got these out of order. This was portion two, I did portion three. Sorry, um, I don't know, maybe I'll remember to to switch that around and edit the video and then edit out this part, but then I lose my puppy study break. So I don't know, we'll see. Um, all right, I mean, presumably you've done part two, you've done portion two and portion three. I'll just have to put that in the description or whatever, so you know how to find it. All right, so consumer has $54, can be spent on good X and on good Y. The price of good Y is always $6 per unit. However, the price of good X is $6 for the first three units, half off or $3 for any additional units purchased. What's the slope of the budget constraint if the consumer purchases seven units of good Y? What about for four units of good X? And then what's the max amount of good X the consumer can afford? This is basically like me coaching you along to build the budget constraint. And then if the consumer views utility derived from consumer consuming good X and good Y as perfect substitutes, as substitutes, how much of each good would the consumer optimally purchase to maximize utility? All right. So the first thing we have to do is we have to generate our budget constraint. So I'm going to write out my pricing. Price of good Y is always six. Price of good X could be six for the first three units. And then afterwards it goes to three. All right. So now that I found the kink point, that's going to be at three. I have to determine how much Y I can have along with these three units of X that take me to this kink. Right. So the first thing I do is I like I'm building, it's hard to see how I've built this here, but the first thing I do is I draw my axis, I draw my vertical endpoint. Right, so that's gonna be nine. Why? Because 54 divided by six, nine. Second thing I do is I find the three right here and how much it costs to get there. It costs 18, right? Because three units of X at a price of six is 18. And what that means is I have 36 remaining. How far can I get in terms of buying Y with 36? Well, 36 divided by six is, is six. So that brings me to here. So my kink point happens at this point right here. Now, over the first three units, the price of X and Y is the same. It's just six, so the slope here is minus one. Over the remaining units, the price of X is half of the price of Y, and so the slope is going to be one half, or minus one and minus one half. Fine, right? So then we want to think about, okay, like how, once I've bought these three units of, of X, suppose I just want to exhaust my budget on X, how much can I buy? Well, I've got 36 remaining. 36 divided by three is 12. Uh, I said this cost 12. I, I should say this cost 36, right? This doesn't cost 12. This costs 36. Allows me to buy an additional 12. So sorry about that right there. Um, and this allows me to get 15 total. I'm sure I put this correctly up here. Um, oh, I got LaTeX lost that. Sorry. Okay, whatever. So, but to go back and answer the questions, what's the slope of the budget constraint if the consumer purchases seven units of good Y? Oh, wait a second. Seven units of good Y is going to cost 42, which means I'm going to have less than 
uh, the amount that I would need to get three, less than 18 remaining. So I can't get to the kink point, right? So if the consumer purchases seven units of Y, they cannot afford more than three units of X. So the slope of the budget constraint is minus one, right? So we're on this portion, right? If I'm buying seven units of Y or whatever. If the consumer purchases four units of X, now I'm past the kink point. Now the slope of the budget constraint has to be this one half. It's basically, I'm just asking you where on the budget constraint are we? All right, so, so then I want to know how much is the maximum amount the consumer can afford if they spend they spend $18, right? $18, sorry, $18 to get to three, and then they spend the remaining $36 to get to 15. That's this right here, okay? If the margin rate of substitution, uh, whoops, so the margin rate of substitution for this utility function is three-fourths, right? MUX is three, MUY is four, just the partial derivatives, which is nothing other than the coefficients for our, when you have a linear function, okay? So margin rate of substitution is just gonna be minus three-fourths. It crosses the budget constraint at the kink, oh, but that's not the solution. I drew in two budget constraints, one right here, and then one right here, both of the slope of, sorry, not two budget constraints, two indifference curves, both with a slope of three-fourths. Okay, so the, the budget constraint does get crossed at the kink, however, this thing kind of opens, right? It's like opening out. And so there's a higher, this This is my budget constraint, right? This black right here is my budget constraint. So I can find a higher indifference curve. Oh, it crosses down here, right? And that should be natural because think about our slopes here, right? Our slope of the bottom part of the budget constraint is minus one half, but the slope of the indifference curve is three four, minus three fourths. And so it's gonna be an all X solution, right? And so the highest, uh, so the highest indifference curve crosses way down here. You see, it's going to be way out in front of my uh, my vertical intercept. And so, yeah, the indifference curves are steeper than the bottom portion of the budget constraint. So the highest indifference curve crosses the horizontal intercept. The consumer optimizes with 15 units of good X and then zero of good Y. All right. All right. Lastly, um, so this one is this one turned out. I love this question now in retrospect, but not for the exam. Um, turned out to be way more complicated than I had uh, that I anticipated, but it's, it's a clever question. Kind of takes kind of a bit of a bit of thought. So I'll walk through the the solution for what it is. The way that we graded this, and actually the the way that we graded, the way that I asked the GSIs to grade was um, look to see are students using Econ 401 methods, and if so, we'll give you the majority of the points. For this one in particular, like if you used econ 401 meth methods and then like got the solution that in retrospect we would expect you to have gotten then you get full credit so uh, i think like one or two students had this solution but they're not the only ones that receive full credit on this question we kind of stopped short of entirely throwing the question off the exam what we wanted to do is just see okay did you use perfect did you use a perfect compliments is this like compliments did you use like a compliments methodology to solve this question if so, then you got most, if not all of the points. All right, so um, all right, so here's our utility function, u of x equals minimum of x and then, and then 2x minus y, which the consumer then has $12 to spend facing prices of a dollar per unit of good x and $3 per unit of good y. Find the optimal consumption bundle. If they get four units of good x for free, find the utility maximizing bundle. What if they get four units of y for free? Find the utility maximizing bundle. We've got to draw the picture. So you have to draw the picture. Here's the picture. All right. So firstly, we have our line through the origin collecting our kink, or through the kinks. Line through the origin that goes through the kinks is line y equals x. Or y minus x is y equals x. So we get that from just setting x equal to 2x minus y. Move the y to the other side. Move the x to the other side. Y equals x. Okay. All right. So we've got that part. Uh, then, we, then I drew in the budget constraint. So the budget constraint... We had 12 available. The price of good X was one. So this is the horizontal intercept of the price of the budget constraint. The price of good Y was three. So it's the vertical intercept of the budget constraint. Good. Uh, and then what we want to do is figure out exactly what these indifference curves are going to look like. So remember from the Kevin and then the Jack example, what we do when we have like, when we have uh, kind of the regular, like, doesn't have the complements or substitutes, um, doesn't have an, op, an addition or subtraction here. We either have a vertical or a, or a horizontal portion. It turns out we have a vertical portion when it's just X. And so and it turns out it's gonna be vertical below the line Y equals X. What about above? Above we actually have 
positive sloping indifference curves corresponding to the fact that good y is a bad when you have more y than x right look what's happening to the utility yeah sure enough y is a bad if you have more y than x and above the indifference above the line above the kink we're going to have positive slope of two it's going to look like this right so let me read through it. Here we have really have to draw the picture. The line through the kinks is given by the line y equals x. The budget constraint has a slope of 1 half and stretches from 0, 4 to 12, 0. Did that. Uh, the indifference curves are vertical lines below the line y equals x and, um, and then have a slope of 2 above the line y equals x. So looking at the indifference curves and the utility function, y is a bad when y is bigger than x. So given the preference shape, you actually never want to purchase y. The optimal bundle exhausts the budget on X. So that's going to be at 12, 0. So the optimal bundle, given these prices, given these preferences, is just going to be right here. So this is going to be the highest indifference curve that we can attain. Just spend all our money on X. And then right with these vertical indifference curves, suppose I would have only bought one or bought a little bit less. Then I'd be like here at 11, right? So going to 12, yeah. So we definitely do want these vertical. Anyway, we, we exhaust our budget, so this is the answer to part A. Here's the answer to part B, here's the answer to part C. Okay, so for part B, now we're getting four units of X for free. This means the consumer can just attain a higher level of X when exhausting their budget. They still want to exhaust their budget on good X. Y is a bad, you don't want any Y. And buying Y would be waste would be wasteful, and so we want to buy, and look what's happening. So you might think we want to buy some of both or worry about how much, but here's how much X we have. And then we're going to double that and then subtract Y. So as long as Y, as long as Y is sufficiently small, then this portion is going to be what's going to govern my utility, this X portion. Okay, good. So we've got that. So now I'm going to buy uh, four more units of good X. The optimal bundle is 16, zero. What if we're given four units of Y for free? We really hate that. We don't want Y. We're assuming it can't d dispose of Y. The optimal bundle is now going to be 12.4. We've got, we've got uh, the four units of Y. We'd accept like 12.0, uh, of course. But there, so the consumer is going to be technically indifferent between 12.4 and 12.0. If we allow the consumer can get rid of, can like dissipate or dispose of those four units of Y, then that's what they're going to do. They're going to be strictly better by um, not having any, not having any, well, not strictly here they're indifferent so there'll be other things equal they're going to want to get rid of the y but um, i suppose weekly better because then if they were to get more x they could move to a higher indifference curve than would be possible if they still had that y so anyway uh all right so the so we've got so the consumer would be unhappy getting it, um, if given more than 12 units of y without being compensated with the ability to purchase additional x to offset the penalty of carrying y Right. So, uh, all right. So here's where here's where they are. They got they're they're spending their money on X. So they got 12 units of X. They were given four units of Y. That keeps them on the same indifference curve, right? So here's 12. Here's the point 12 four. Four was Y. So this is where they are in part C. And yeah, they're indifference between these two. If they can somehow get rid of those units of Y, then they'd also be back here. Right? So uh, they're indifferent between 12 zero and 12 four. Uh, the optimal given the idea that they have to keep those four units of Y would be the point uh, 12, four. Okay. So, and, and again, so the way that we scored this was like, did people use econ 401 methods to solve a perfect complements problem? And then was your reasoning like otherwise consistent with how you solved out? And if so, you got like most of the points. Okay. All right. So let me go ahead and conclude here. And there's our puppy study break to finish off. Anyway,